Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab, all on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kathleen Hicks here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and I'm so happy you can join us today for a book talk from Peter Singer. Along with August Cole, Peter has just put out a book called Burn In. Peter is a senior fellow and strategist at New America Foundation. Um, and we're so thrilled to have you with us here, Peter. Peter, I also hosted you for your last book talk, which was nonfiction work, something called Like War, which was wonderful. So I was excited to have you back, and this time for a piece of fiction. And I want to start our conversation right there, which is what made you decide to uh, write this book as fiction? Sure. Well, let me begin by thanking you in turn and um, everybody who's uh, joining us uh, remotely and, and the whole team at CSIS who's putting together the logistics uh, behind the scenes for this. Uh, I know it's not easy right now, so I uh, very much appreciate it. So um, Burnin is, is a little bit of both. Um, it is a combination of fiction and nonfiction. So it is a novel, it's a techno thriller that follows the hunt for a terrorist through a future Washington DC, but it's also nonfiction in that um, it reflects a nonfiction research project. Baked into the story are over 300 explanations and projections of uh, various um, trends that are out there, whether they are technology trends like how does AI work? Uh, what are its expected applications in security, in business, in your home? To what are the issues that we're going to be dealing with? Uh, the dilemmas, the debates. And again, they might be political dilemmas or debates. They might be cybersecurity or national security problems. And so basically, it's this idea of using the novel as a package for that. So you've got the plot, but you also have 27 pages of endnotes uh, documenting how, hey, this actually is drawn from the real world in just the way you would in a nonfiction package. And um, the idea behind it uh, really came from the experience that we had had with um, our Ghost Fleet project, which had started out as a novel, and yet it had, um, you know, it's going to hurt both of us to say this, but actually had more impact than my nonfiction work did. Uh, you know, I had books on military reading lists and the like, but um, Ghost Fleet was the one that not only was read more, including, you know, by the most senior people, it's the one that got me invited to brief its lessons more, you know, everywhere from the White House to uh, the um, uh, the tank, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs meeting room, to um, count up over 75 different military units and government organizations. Um, but it also sparked multiple investigations, uh, both within the Defense Department, also within the GAO. Uh, the Navy even named a $3.6 billion program Ghost Fleet. Uh, and so we came out of that saying, wow, isn't it striking that we didn't intend to have this impact what is it about it? And so what we did with Burn In is that we, from the very start, baked in the research that we thought was important, but also wanted to share with the idea that beyond just our own personal experience, research from fields like psychology, et cetera, show that narrative is actually a more effective tool for communicating than even the most canonical academic sources. And uh, you know, the bottom line for me is um, story is the oldest uh, communication technology of all versus a PowerPoint. It's only 30 years old and we know it doesn't work all that well. So why should we not use what, what works and what's more entertaining? Yeah, you know, it's so interesting your point about impact and, uh, you know, the fact that it was looked at as fiction, you're, you're right to point out in both cases that you you have a lot of research behind them. And in this case, you know, you have very thorough footnoting throughout. Um, when you approached this book this time, and you've written nonfiction in between, by the way, those pieces, and you focused on different aspects of technology in our future, what made you decide to pick this issue area of robotics and AI? So um, AI is, and in the broader field of uh, robotics, um, it's interesting because on one hand in the fiction side, uh, we're on the 100 year anniversary of the creation of the word robot itself. 
Uh, it was in a 1920, what we would call science fiction play. And, you know, ever since then, it's, it's filled that space. Um, and what's interesting is that it, the depictions in science fiction have influenced uh, real world discussion. You think about um, the killer robots debate uh, that has taken place everywhere from inside the Pentagon uh, to um, the floor of the United Nations. Uh, it's driven a lot of research, actually. Uh, there's one program that's a $5 billion program on research around existential threats and robots. We have, you know, this part going on. But in the real world, in terms of um, technology, AI is arguably not just the most important story right now, but maybe in all of human history. And by that, what I mean, it's not just me thinking that, you know, again, we can put hard data behind it. Uh, they've done surveys of leaders and um, one of them found, for example, that 91% of leaders think that AI is the most important game changing technology out there. You can also see it um, in strategy documents, you know, something that you and I, uh, we, we might be the only kind of people who actually love reading them uh, <laughs> versus novels, but um, you can see it in everything from the, you know, national defense strategy of the US to China's uh, strategy um, to um, Fortune 500 company strategies. All of them talk about the importance of AI. And yet there is a disconnect. Another survey found, you know, while 91% of leaders may say it's the most important thing, only 17% say, I even have a passing familiarity with it, let alone its applications, its dilemmas and the like. And so we've got that kind of disconnect and that disconnect is also played out in terms of the um, science fiction influence on the real world, where uh, a lot of people think it's um, off in the distance. Uh, for example, the secretary of um, the treasury said that we don't have to think about AI and automation for, quote, 50 to 100 years, end quote. It's happening right now. It's playing out right now. And it's not playing out in the killer robot revolt, but it is playing out in terms of a technology that's changing our economy, our politics. It's also being woven into our national security. It has obviously cybersecurity implications. So it's important to understand and yet we have that disconnect. And so that was what drove us to that topic. Um, and uh, we wanted then to sort of use the new methods to share it across. So uh, before I ask you another question, I do want to remind uh, uh, folks who are listening in and watching to please send in um, questions via the link that they have on the event page. Peter, why don't you give us the summary of the book that doesn't give away the book, uh, which I very much have feared that I will give away the book. So I'm going to let you introduce it uh, the way you know best. Well, that, that that's one of the great things about it, but also the difficult challenges. You know, there's no um, bottom line up front. Uh, or there's no, um, you know, at the end of it, the six bullet points on, and this is what we ought to do. Um, so uh, not to reveal too much, but uh, on, in terms of the fictional side, it follows a um, Marine veteran turned uh, FBI agent, uh, Lara Keegan, um, as an aside, that's one of the other things that's a little bit different about this book is um, having a, a uh, female protagonist at the center. That's not what you see in most techno thrillers. Uh, a lot of issues behind that. But um, we follow her as she is assigned a new technology that is also in a certain way a new kind of partner, uh, which is TAMS. Uh, acronyms, of course, um, Tactical Autonomous Mobility System. TAMS is basically the AI side of um, your Siri or your Alexa move forward. Um, but also the hardware side of current uh, robotics, you know, what's in prototype stage deployed out there. So think of, for example, uh, people might have seen whether it's certain military systems to the YouTube clips of, um, you know, a robot from Boston Dynamics doing parkour. TAMS is basically that. So she is assigned to burn in TAMS. Burn in, the, the name itself is a technical term uh, for when you um, put a new technology to a test in, in order to learn from it, when you push it to the breaking point. Obviously, that, that idea is also a sort of larger symbolic of um, what's happening with technology in our society right now. Also, this idea of the book being a different kind of burn in. At the same time this is happening, you have another protagonist, I won't give too much away, um, who's basically 
using um, all the new vulnerabilities that are out there in the real world to essentially um, hold the city of Washington, D.C. hostage. Uh, and um, this, again, shows you the, the duality of the, the research. Um, in some situations, the research behind it was you know, classic pulling together um, reports and studies. Uh, for example, we built a, a data set uh, it has um, studies of, of job automation. Uh, so, you know, everything from what um, think tanks project to um, what McKinsey, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers project, Oxford, World Bank, you name it. It's actually in the Excel spreadsheet, there's 1300 of these projections overall. So we read all of them and pulled them together so that you don't have to. Um, and from that, we carry across that data like what jobs will be affected or not. But then what to me is interesting is that you can take those numerics and strangely make it real through character experience. So one um, key thing that, that's playing out is that automation is not just hitting uh, what you might think of as blue collar jobs, you know, factory worker, truck driver. It's hitting um, all sorts of other jobs across the spectrum. And obviously for people who care about national security in the military, each of these have parallel on the military side. So we communicate that through a character who's Keegan's husband, who is a um, uh, lawyer who's been bottomated. Um, he's uh, been making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year as a contract lawyer. This is a field that does very well right now, but is on its way to being drastically reduced. And so through him, we see, okay, what does that do when you move into um, gig work remotely? You um, are, are, how does it affect not just your identity, your, your family, your marriage, your politics? So we've got that kind of you know hard data coming across numerics reports and the like, but then we also have things like from interviews. Um, so for example, interviewed um, people who worked on I'll, I'll plot spoil a little bit here uh, different water systems in the Washington D.C. area. And uh, besides the threat reports from cybersecurity, what they talk about uh, will will chill you even more. Um, and so we we share that across. Um, and, you know, for people who don't think uh, it's real, uh, we have a historic version, um, which is uh, people can Google the 1936 flood and see what Washington, D.C. looked from that. Uh, that was caused through natural means and there's um, uh, cyber means to cause that. Or they can look at um, this is one of these uh, strange things that we've experienced from this approach of what played out in Israel just a couple of weeks ago where um, uh, Israeli water treatment systems, uh, they uh, reported that someone was inside the network trying to affect the um, chlorine level and water coming out of uh, Israeli um, sinks. Um, I have bad news for you if you think that uh, the water treatment systems at um, the little small towns, you know, upriver on the Potomac have better cybersecurity than the Israeli government. <laughs> Well, I do want to come to this point you just raised in there, which is the, the way in which the book is able to look 360 degrees at effects um, of technology. And again, not similarly, trying not to give too much away because you have uh, the protagonist, the main protagonist, the FBI agent, Laura, who's, you know, she's at work, she's at home, she's um, on the beat, so to speak. When she's at home, you see all these other aspects that a typical, um, you know, a piece of nonfiction focused on security threats, for instance, and AI, how AI intersects with security threats wouldn't display. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about the family dynamic. You, you mentioned the, the husband um, having to do gig work, but there's also a child in the house and you all imagineer essentially a, a sort of wonderful odd, different world for children in the future. I think that's a good insight into how this, this book can get at the issues in a holistic way. It, it, I appreciate that. And also, um, you know, we, we kind of put this, um, I think it points to the value of narrative and, and um, we've, we've called it sometimes uh, useful fiction or ficent is a term that um, August has coined. And it's the idea that you have different tools of analysis. Um, you've got SIGINT, signals reports, uh, intelligence. We've got human. Ficent is combining narrative, creating a world, characters populating that world, but with real world research. So it's not pie in the sky, science fiction on future planets. 
it's um, taking the real world research and, and set it in the real world, real world places, um, real world uh, friction or fog, like a Clausewitz would, would advise. Um, and then you follow them through that world. And so you get to see it from different um, places and locales. And, and uh, you know, we, we set the book in Washington, D.C. of the future. And that means we get to follow the characters everywhere from, you know, their government job, the office, to as they're deployed, um, you know, what is Union Station like to you know, there's a firefight. What is it, what is it going to be like in a firefight in the future as you're weaving in various unmanned systems and the like um, to we get to follow them home. Um, and that allows you to see one of the, um, I think, you know, real trends that um, uh, we talk about a lot in national security, but it's hard to really kind of visualize, which is not only, okay, what is AI like, but even trends like uh, the democratization of um, technology, the idea that different from past generations, some of the most advanced technology will be widely proliferated. So it's you know not a story of only a couple of powers having um, nuclear power weapons. It's you know AI in the hands of everyone, which means uh, something like face recognition software where you know you as a someone working for government and in, in national security there will be scenarios where you have it but oh by the way it will be applied against you as a consumer when you walk into that train station oh by the way it will be applied against your child uh, in trying to um, shape what they buy uh, and so that that is a way of visualizing it and you get to come at it um, you also of course get to come at it from different character perspectives. So, you know, you have your hero, you also have your villain. And so that allows you to explore things like, um, you know, a particular message underlined and in terms of the security is just how incredibly vulnerable um, uh, Internet of Things is, that we're, we're baking in massive vulnerabilities which are going to change cybersecurity um, from threats that are about theft of information to more and more um, what the United States pioneered with Stuxnet, which are cyber attacks that cause physical damage. The difference being that it's not going to take, uh, you know, massive efforts of NSA and associated like to build Stuxnet, like what happened. It's going to be in the hands of even one individual. And that opens up again, you know, changes in, in security effects, it changes in the threats that are out there, changes in um, even the way that we need to think about uh, d defense. And I think relevant to a lot of things going on right now, um, we have too much of a deterrence framework thinking that we can scare away certain attacks um and in a world where you've got this lowering it's more about resilience uh there will be certain types of attacks that um you won't be able to scare away even with the threat of the most overwhelming punishment and so what you want instead are, are resilient systems and oh by the way that allows you to explore some of these other new national security threats that are out there um, for example, uh, climate change, um, uh, which again is not something that you can scare away. It's more about building resilience to it. Yeah, so you choose to focus around this challenge set as it presents itself in a domestic threat context. The, the actors, at least um, in, in this book, I, I note that the book ends with the potential for more books. So at least in this book, uh, you have a, a, a variety of different domestic characters, but they are American and they're, um, you know, they're disgruntled or they have different approaches or views about how society is changing. Did you uh, select that set of threat vectors because you think it's underexamined, or what was your reason for moving from a sort of a US China focus like in Ghost Fleet to a domestic context for security? Yeah, it's, um, it's a great question. And, and it's something that, you know, there's things that I thought, and then obviously the events the last several weeks, um, we're all doing soul searching, and um, I'm uh, reflecting on the fact that, you know, my last um, two books, uh, uh, in many ways, where if, you know, I've, I've likened um, uh, the whole enterprise of um, this, you know, nonfiction within a novel is um, uh, like sneaking fruit and veggies into a smoothie, except for the policy world, um, you know, so we're, we're uh, sneaking information in, in an enjoyable package, just like you would do to your kids. Um, and 
and I'm, you know, that was one way that I've thought about this, this framing of using narrative, but I also have been reflecting on the fact that the last two books, um, which have been thought of as national security, uh, both, uh, have had largely domestic themes to them. When you think about uh, disinformation, um, online that weaponization, being, that, being like war. that being like war, and then um, you know the setting of Burnin is is in Washington D.C. So there was obviously a fictional side of you know we had explored a U.S.-China war. There you know obviously could have been a, 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 a stain in that world. Um, same characters, uh, you know, kind of the way, you know, Tom Clancy did where like, you know, Jack Ryan went from analyst to, you know, president and or whatever. But, and it was funny, we also had, you know, people on the army side saying, you know, you did ghost fleet. When are you going to do an army ghost fleet? Um, you know, and, um, that's, but you know, so one is you, as a, as a, your creator side, you want to explore different worlds. Um, and, but I also think it, um, connects to, something that we're all feeling right now, which is, um, uh, yes, there is a clear strategic competitor in China. And, you know, I've got the bona fides of, of arguing that before that narrative played out in, in much of DC. So I can't be challenged on that, but I will add this. I think our greater challenge um, is at home. Uh, and we can see it in all sorts of different ways. Um, and what burn in and, and what burn in, in many ways is exploring that of, um, these forces of change, uh, how they're hitting the United States. Um, but they're hitting the United States. That's more divided than ever. That also is, uh, more brittle than it thinks. Um, and you know, this was all coming out of the project of the last couple of years, you know, the, the, we started um, this project roughly about four years back. Uh, I think right now we all feel that in, in so many different ways. And so, you know, I think uh, that, that may be, you know, in certain ways of trying to communicate to the national security community, not just about, um, you know, the importance of AI and here's how you understand it, but also about uh, these challenges we face um, are not just uh, abroad, they're at home. Um, and again, that's, you can see that even in thinking about, um, the way we frame the challenge of, uh, extremism and terrorism. Um, again, uh, there's, we've not come at it as, as a full, uh, 360 and, and that blind spot is, has caused horrific consequences. I mean, you know, you, you see, you look at the data, of, uh, for example, um, uh, white nationalist shootings, um, you know, uh, by the numbers, they've killed more Americans than members of ISIS. Uh, that is seen as odd for someone in national security to point out just by the numbers, right? So again, I'm just sort of getting at this larger, um, uh, setting it at home allowed us to explore in a fictional sense, a new world to drive home this change. But it also, I think, reinforces what we all should know right now, which is that uh, even those of us that care about national security and how the U.S. represents itself abroad um, and how it operates abroad, it is as, as much or frankly more important now in um, facing the deep, deep challenges and divisions that we have at home. Yeah, and for the audience's sake, I was saying to Peter just beforehand, if you read this book in the midst of everything that's happening right now, which I can't get into because I don't want to give away the book, it, there are, it is... Um, it is amazing how many uh, takeaways there are that are uh, frighteningly similar. Um, we can jump into those. I mean, there's a. I, I'll do it without pause. Yeah, but, if you're if you're willing to, please do. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been um, uh, uncanny, uh, <laughs> um, and 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 there's no you know joy in it um, because you know the goal is not to be. Pre predictive per se, and uh, you know again you you for some people you look for them. It's just going to be escapist. It's going to be fun. Um, it's, it's not about a pandemic. Uh, uh, so I'll, we'll plot spoil that way. Um, and a lot of people won't go check the footnotes out. That's, that's totally fine. Um, people need a really good read right now. Um, and I find that uh, fascinating. I was looking um, at the history of this. Um, actually, you know, when times are tough, the interesting thing is uh, dystopian fiction does better. Um, in World War II Britain, which um, had real rationing, not our you know, version of like, oh, I can't get the exact cut of beef I want. 
right? They had real rationing. The book sales actually doubled in, in World War II Britain. Um, so uh, there's a history of this, um, not just the escapism, the, the education side. Um, you know, you think of the, the role of whether it's, um, it can't happen here, Sinclair Lewis to, um, Margaret Atwood's work. Uh, it, these warn you of how bad it can get if you let things get out of control. Um, and so for us, you know, there's that role of the dystopic fiction, but then, oh, by the way, we've got the footnotes to back it up for whether it's that example of the cyber attack that happens or the example of, you know, here's the trends on um, uh, automation to a certain type of job to you know, just for technical people. Oh, uh, you know, I, I had someone in special operations was like, there's a scene and, and, and you know, there's a sniper rifle. And I thought, no way that exists. And there's that footnote. Um, but what's been uncanny, though, and sort of disturbing is other parts of it that have played out. And it might be that example of, you know, some things have been um, caused technologically by coronavirus. Um, by that, I mean, there were trends with the applications of AI and robotics that have gotten drastically sped up by the pandemic. Um, I, in some fields, it went to levels that they didn't think that they would be. Um, so for example, telemedicine is a field I'm, I'm familiar with. Um, they, in a couple of weeks, jumped to where the industry thought it would be 10 years from now. Other fields um, were doing remote work at a level that the people who work in that sector did not think would happen ever. Um, it might be applications of technology, uh, the use of robotics and everything from um, policing, they're out there policing curfews, to um, grocery deliveries. For those of us who live in Washington, DC, they're in the, in the book, in the opening scene, there's this futuristic seeming uh, delivery robot that goes along the sidewalk beside um, two of the characters. That's happened now. It's not futuristic. Um, uh, so there's those types of two, AI surveillance of society. Um, you know, again, we are getting to levels that not just science fiction never played with, but you know, even the Chinese government didn't dream of. Um, so some of that has been pandemic move forward. There's been other parts of it that um, I think is what dis is disturbing to me is they didn't have footnotes and I don't know whether to add them for the paperback or not. So two examples are um, in one scene there, uh, our main character goes to um, the old executive office building where the National Security Council is and then goes into the White House. And, um, you know, it, it has things that are real that, you know, you and I like the, it, how the carpet really is. I made sure to notice that. So we get to share with people those sort of, sort of funny things like that. But to, in the future set, we had it um, that uh, the security perimeter for it had been pushed out a block and that there were high fences around it. Um, another scene had, um, has riot police. I thought it would be sort of this iconic dystopic moment it has riot police uh, protecting the Lincoln uh, Memorial. So those didn't take 15 years to happen. Those took a week to happen. And now I'm like, do I put a footnote? Uh, which those, you know, that, that, that part is disturbing to me. Um, and I think it, you know, again, points to the um, importance of what's going on all around us and, um, being careful to not let these more dystopic visions come true. Uh, we have a number of audience questions, but I want to ask you one more, which is, you know, in the in the book, the way the AI technology plays out is, as I said, 360 degree. It, there are huge advantages and potential for advantages. There's obviously dislocation and then there's there's threat. Is that a fair way to describe how you think about how we should think about technology? Yeah, it's, um, you know, for me, uh, where I come down is technology is, is a tool by definition. And every single technology, you know, whether it was the very first one, someone picking up a stone to, you know, a modern day drone um, has had both good and bad applications by good and bad people with a mix of good and bad effects. You know, we don't know, but that first stone was either used to 
you know, smash a, a nut to get at the, the good nutrition inside or to bash someone over the head. Um, drones uh, have obviously been applied into war and, you know, depends on which side of the battlefield you think about their good and bad effect. Drones have been, um, are out there right now being used to, um, by human rights groups to document war crimes. Um, so that's how I see it. And I think that's more realistic than, you know, either these, um, incredibly dystopian views or, you know, what often comes out of Silicon Valley, this uh, sometimes almost insane level of techno optimism. Um, when you apply it in the real world, it, that's how it plays out. Um, I think the other aspect of it is understanding um, something that um, Gibson said, the science fiction writer Gibson, but I think it's instructive to those of us in the real world, which is, you know, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. And that uneven distribution um, has a lot of different facets to it. One is um, this idea that uh, you already see what's playing out. You know, we don't have to have it, it may seem like sci-fi to some, but it's already here. It's just not being uh, applied in each and every role. It might be also the, the threat side. You know, um, certain types of cyber attacks have already happened that just may not have happened to the U.S. yet. Um, and so we put our blinders on around that. But also what I get in terms of that uneven distribution is two other um, aspects. One is we tend to think of technology and particularly AI as singular. Like there's one single use of it, one single super intelligence. And instead what we have playing out right now and what will play out is all sorts of different applications of it. So you will see Everything from, and we already are starting to see, you know, small, tiny micro drones in the hands of everyone from a soldier in the field to a police officer to a kid. Um, and it might fly out there autonomously on its own to um, at the other end of the spectrum, there are things that the human will be inside it but it will be largely autonomous. Um, what we see right now with um, F-35, uh, where the human role is moved less so from, you know, joysticking around to managing it and everything that it does to um, what's playing out with cars right now, you know. Uh, and then we've got in the middle all sorts of different ways that robots might team up with a human. It might be the equivalent of a um, police dog. You know, it, 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 it works with you, but you task it off to do certain things. And again, this might matter in war, policing, construction, medical surgery, you name it. Then there are other types that are um, uh, what the Air Force is called robotic wingmen. And it might be the Air Force vision of it, literally like a wingman flying alongside of it, or it's just the idea that it's a partner to you. So you've got all of these different applications out there. We have to think through what that means. What are the best ones for each role? Oh, by the way, the enemy gets a vote. How's a bad guy, be it a, a China, be it a terrorist, go after that? But then we have the final aspect of uneven distribution, which is that um, it's everything from, uh, you know, they say the future is unpredictable. I'm willing to predict that the U.S. government acquisition system is not going to be fixed in the next 15 years. So that means different um, government agencies will have different levels and types of technology. They may show up to the same incident, but it's going to be different depending on which unit they come from. But more importantly, the uneven distribution means that, yes, you'll have AI and driverless cars and face recognition. Oh, by the way, you'll still have homelessness. You'll still have traffic jams. You'll still have all this other, you know, things. You'll still have racism. Um, and those, that, that to me is um, an important story to tell and help people visualize that world in a realistic way, as opposed to that singular way of thinking about technology good, technology bad, or this is the one technology use. We have several questions that are around technology competition and AI in particular. Um, I wonder if you can just give some thoughts on how, you know, how whether you think that frame first, the US-China technology rivalry or competition is a good frame that's helpful for us to think through. And then second, um, what are, whatever your answer is, what's the implication of that for allied and partner countries? Um, I think it is definitely a, um, there is a real competition that is there. Uh, 
I don't, I'm not a fan of the Cold War framing of it because I think there are certain fundamental differences um, in terms of the context and, and the competitor itself. Uh, you know, so the, the Soviet Union, if we're honest about it, was never really a technology competitor, um, except in a couple of key areas, uh, you know, basically the, the uh, rocketry and the, and the early parts of the space race. But, you know, across the board, I mean, you know, we're a generation ahead of them in everything from uh, aircraft, you know, they never invent stealth to they never even make a, a decent personal computer, let alone a decent car. Right. Um, uh, versus a China, um, not just a political competitor, an economic competitor, a technology competitor, working in lots of different realms. Another fundamental difference is um, completely lashed up into the global economy in the way the Soviet Union wasn't, as both a producer and a, and a marketplace. Um, and so, you know, the nature of that competition means it, it expresses itself just fundamentally different. Um, and that's uh, too often that framing goes back not to just sort of cold war talk but like certain you know strategies if this you know one versus the other side um i think there are lessons from the past that carry over uh that you know frankly too often are forgotten um so you know in, in our bipolar framing we forget that you know the advantage that the u.s had was um the fact that it was uh, a part of a, a larger alliance of nations um, and that it had an attractive vision, whether it was attractive politically, economically, socially, that drew in um, more and more allies and partners, again, whether it's economically, whether it's in scientific um, discovery. Um, it also, uh, you know, going back to our discussion earlier, uh, the U.S. wins that competition um, not in third world battlefields, it wins it um, arguably uh, at home um, in terms of, you know, if we're thinking about the technology side, uh, our inventions, our um, uh, move forwards. And part of that was, um, it wasn't, uh, you know, you think about the incredible role of um, uh, you know, different, um, pretty, you look at the studies, I'm trying to remember the exact figure, but I believe it is don't hold me this, but every leading technology company in the U.S. right now was started either directly by an immigrant or a son of an immigrant uh, or daughter of an immigrant in terms of the founding group. Um, to you go back and look at you know the story of the early uh, uh, space race and the like. Um, in turn, when we eject people, um, we lose. Uh, I did an article many years back about um, the creation of the Chinese. Uh, rocketry program that led to their nuclear missile program and their current space assets. And it all comes out of actually a scientist who um, lived in the United States, worked uh, on the Manhattan Project for the U.S. government, top security clearance and the like, and during the McCarthy scares was kicked out of the country. Um, he, we lost an asset and he went on to you know, create a competitor. Uh, so I think about that a lot in given current context. Um, more broadly, let me sort of swing it back, is that I really think it comes down to two very different visions in this competition of AI. Um, one is the Chinese vision, which um, is government-led, highly centralized. Uh, and when I say that, it extends into the private sector, but it's the private sector, you know, China has created national champions who then have to share data across. And so it's, that's one model. And then you have the US model, which um, has a some, but not sufficient strategy on the government side, some not sufficient investment on the government side. And then a lot of things working contrary to that investment, like I mentioned in terms of what we do in R and D, what we do in immigration, et cetera. But then you also have this cacophony of um, various private sector actors, uh, each doing their own. And um, the result is, you know, we'll see which model wins out. For how we depict that in the book is um, our character's journey you get to see that cacophony through her eyes, how you will go some places and someone working for government will have uh, access to all forms of data, not just data, but the predictive nature of what AI allows. Then there will be other areas where they will go and they will realize that the private sector has more data, more predictive power, more influence. 
Um, and then there will be other parts of the nation and the experience where you go where they might be a new kind of dead zone. And it might be something where face recognition is banned. Um, we're seeing that in certain cities or university campuses, or it might be a dead zone because um, it's a part of the country that's been left behind. We also have a question on modeling and simulation, which is a huge topic right now in terms of how to think through um, scenarios and futures and AI itself opens up a lot of promise on, on modeling and sim. But the question is about what, um, what it, in your mind is the most compelling example now um, that you can think of where having good or enhanced modeling and sim of AI effects um, is needed? How do we how do we think about what we should be gaming or modeling um, with regard to potential effects? Mm, that is a really good question. Um, I, let me throw two things out there, and, and one's going to be a tip of the hat to um, your program. Uh, but I would have said it even if I was somewhere else. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, there has been um, work done uh, that CSS was part of the consortium on, on trying to work out, and, and more needs to be done on this, of um, what does it mean for uh, the different, for the strategic environment? Um, and by that, we mean, you know, crises all the way up to nuclear exchange. Um, in a world where you have more and more sensors out there of a variety of different types, you know, so it's not just more spy satellites, but you know, people with phones in hand, you name it, adding in artificial intelligence that allows you to sift through all of that information, mine and combine little data points to draw out new insights, predict behavior and the like. But oh, by the way, also opens up a world, it's networks, so it opens up a world of everything from spoofing and disinformation to hacking of networks. How does that change the environment? How does that change the assumptions that we've been thinking about? Uh, you know, what does it look like in a crisis? And what are the kind of decisions that have to be made? And, you know, a great example of that is that you will see um, more and more uh, numeric data provided to senior policymakers. We have a 79% confidence level in X, Y, or Z. Um, and uh, that, of course, changes the way that policymakers have to be trained. Uh, you know, one worry for me is I think about, you know, how people misunderstood the um, 2016 election simulations and like everyone was surprised and you're, and you're like, no, 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 that was saying, you know, yeah, it was in the data five times. Yeah. It was not saying like it's actually right. Um, I worry about that, like in, in terms of, you know, battlefield or, or crisis behavior. Um, the part that is the next that's going to be interesting. I, and I really, you know, um, is how do we think about, so AI, each side is developing AI. They'll use it more and more for battle management, planning, you name it. Um, how do you simulate when two AI systems come together? So, you know, we think about a, a, a South China Sea or whatever, and you have a U.S. battle management system um, that's advising, you know, I'm not saying Terminator, it's making, I'm just saying the way we plan to use it right now is advising courses of actions, sifting through data, and you have a Chinese system that equally they're weaving in. It's, we, we could do these kind of war gaming of like, okay, we know this is the Soviet doctrine, and we know this is our doctrine, and we know the you know t80 tank can shoot this hundred meters well now you've got the combination of um ai that that you won't even want to reveal or it won't even know how it comes together and oh by the way you'll have lots of different technologies that are hard to game out because their effects are really hard you know a cyber weapon um it's not like it's it's 10 percent better than the previous generation so that kind of gaming and modeling i think is going to be really, really difficult, but also points to, again, you want to, um, I think, go after it through uh, as many different models and scenarios to kind of draw out broader lessons from it. So let me ask you one final question before we run out of time. Uh, what are you hoping that national security professionals in particular take away from this work? Um, three things. Uh, the first 
is I hope Vernon equips them with an understanding and a vocabulary uh, of these key issues and themes that again cut across um, you know whatever part of the field you specialize in. Um, you know whether you are someone interested in counterinsurgency or someone interested in military logistics or whatever is that we see these trends, we see these technologies affecting them all. We see the dilemmas that I that we explore in the book. You know, an example of something like algorithmic bias is um, a, a complex idea. It's basically around the idea of how um, the model or the data going into the model can lead to biased outcomes, you know, lead to something other than was planned. That that applies, you know, again, across everything from intelligence community and targeting to someone working in the field of military medicine, you name it. What I'm getting at is that um, uh, I hope people walk away from the book understanding, getting that grasp of these terms, these ideas, so that when they hear it, when they see it, it's not their, you know, in, in a meeting, it's not their first exposure. And they don't do the very classic DC thing of acting like they really know what it is, because we don't like to ask questions to reveal that, right? It's, we do that particularly with acronyms. We nod our head when we hear a new acronym, and then, then later we Google it. Um, and the idea of the package is that um, I fully recognize that more people are going to be exposed to them through the novel than they are by a white paper or a PowerPoint. Um, and, that, and, and also because people share on it. Um, no one ever said, man, that was such a good PowerPoint. You ought to read it on your next um, you know, beach vacation. Uh, it's just not how it works. So I, I hope you know, they get, is a different way of saying, they get the veggies, yeah. the, the nutrition out of the smoothie. Second issue is, um, I, and again, that doesn't mean like the dilemmas that it doesn't mean you're going to get all the answers, but you will get exposure to them. Um, you will be wrestling with these questions. Second thing is, I hope it sparks action on whatever nightmare scenario from it they uh, uh, worries them the most. For some people, it might be the overall trends. For other people, it might be a very specific moment in the book. I hope uh, that they read that and then go, okay, what am I going to do to prevent my organization, my unit, my family, my personal life from that actually happening. Um, so I hope it's that act of not prevention, sorry, act of not prediction, but prevention. Hope, um, and again, I think the packaging and the narrative uh, studies show you're more likely to act on it in that than, than a typical warning set. So again, there's lots of different scenarios in it that different parts of the community might, might draw on. Just like in Ghost Fleet, for some people, it was like supply chain security. For other people, it was a cyber thing. Same thing here. The third is um, I hope people enjoy it. Uh, I hope they have a, a, you know, a real fun uh, escapist read. Um, we've built characters that um, I hope people uh, love. I hope people hate. Uh, and so I, you know, I equally just love people saying, um, man, it was, you know, uh, this scene or this this moment this really got me um and uh again one of the great things about it uh is um by following just a a, a set of characters and this is different than ghost fleet is mm -hmm. that you get to spend more time with them and um hopefully you get to experience the highs and the lows and you know i i find myself like thinking of them as my friends are getting sad when something happens to a certain character. And so, you know, I hope the same thing. I hope people uh, just enjoy it. Well, Peter, let me say I enjoyed it. I found it very entertaining and uh, very enlightening and it's sticking with me. I'm thinking about a lot of things that are provoked from the book. The book is Peter Singer and August Cole Burnin, a novel of real robotic revolution. And I have no doubt it is available at any bookseller and audio. I know it's on audio as well. Thanks so much for joining us today, Peter. Thank you again. Bye-bye.